Hello, friends. Welcome to Restoration Church out here on the lawn. It's a nice and toasty day out here today. Thank you for joining us and braving the heat. For those of you online, welcome. In the comfort of your air-conditioned homes, you are winning, winning and a little envy going on this morning here for all y'all. Hey, but we are here to worship the Lord and uh, to give him honor and praise and to re be reminded of all that he has accomplished for our for us and um, and the truth of the peace and the life that he has provided us. So I pray that you are encouraged today. I pray that you are strengthened, challenged, and renewed. Would you please stand with us, those of you in person? And what, online, you, you're welcome to do whatever you want. If you are able, please stand and uh, sing with us. The battle belongs to the Lord. When all I see is the battle, you see my victory. I fight, I fight on my knees. 
So if you're familiar with the story of Joseph in the Old Testament, you'll know that he was uh, treated really poorly by his brothers. They tried to kill him on a few different occasions. They were very jealous of him because uh, he was beloved by his father and he was given special gifts by his father. And so in their jealousy, they tried to get rid of him. They ended up throwing him in a pit and he ended up uh, being sold into slavery and living a good portion of his life in bondage. But through circumstances that, you know, only, only God could have ordained, he, he found himself as the second in command in all of Egypt. And after looking back on all that he had experienced, all the pain that he went through, all of the turmoil, all of the agony, the, the weeping, the crying, the loneliness, here's what he said in regards to all that he had experienced. You intended, speaking to his brothers, you intended to harm me. Right? There was evil that was intended for me. The enemy who was behind all of your actions wanted nothing but my demise. But God. Right? We love but God. We talk about that a lot here. But God. He intended it for good to accomplish what is now being done, the saving of many lives. I hope that you're encouraged this morning that whatever you may be going through, whatever circumstances you may be enduring, that the enemy may intend it for evil, but God is working it for good. We're going to continue singing about this battle and the victory that has been accomplished and won in Jesus Christ. with the enemy memory. 
gonna see a victory for the battle belongs to you Lord I'm gonna see a victory I'm gonna see a victory for the battle belongs to you Lord I'm gonna see a victory I'm gonna see a Yes, Father, I pray that we might become a people who learn to fight upon our knees, acknowledging that the victory has already been won and all that you've accomplished in Jesus Christ on our behalf. Father, you looked upon a world that was in an infinite pit that we had dug for ourselves, a pit that though we had tried to climb out of through religion and works and following the law, Father, could not possibly have been done. And we tried, and we tried, and we tried. And seeing how futile it was, Father, you came into our world compelled by your love, and you embraced us in our sin. You leaned in our direction while we were still far from you, Father. You came near to us to invite us back home, to invite us back into a relationship with you, to invite us back into life and into our rescue and into salvation. This is all the work of you, Father. It's not because of anything we have done. It's not because we deserved it. It's not because we were good enough. It's not because we had earned it, Father. You, seeing us sinners as we are, compelled by your love, sent Jesus Christ to die on our behalf, Father. And I want to thank you publicly in this place and before this community, Father. I want to thank you for what you have done for us. And I want to praise and glorify and honor your name this morning. Father, you're worthy of all praise. And I pray now, Father, that we then, acknowledging all of this, might become a people of greater trust in who you are and your goodness towards us. And a people, Father, who fight the battle upon our knees, knowing that, again, the victory has already been won. Father, we pray now that you would open our hearts and minds to receive the words of your word this morning, Father, and to help us renew our minds as we fight these battles with the truth of your word. We pray this in the matchless name of Jesus and all he's accomplished for us. And all who agreed said, amen. You all can uh, give a wave to somebody nearby and then you can take a seat. Hey friends, welcome again to Restoration Church. So glad that for those of you who have joined us on the lawn, uh, you have decided to do so on this beautiful May day. Okay. I'm hesitant to say beautiful just because how hot it is, but it really is gorgeous out the here. The breeze is nice. The breeze is nice, yeah. There's na nature's air conditioning. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> That's right. Uh, hey, welcome, friends. Uh, if you've been with us a little while, maybe it's your very first time here. Maybe you've been around a little while and you're ready to let us know who you are because you want to get acclimated into this awesome community of restoration. You want to grow with us. Uh, you want to know us better. get to know us better, uh, serve alongside us, help us love our community, grow to become like Jesus with us. Um, there is a connection card online that's being dropped. Uh, we also have one in person right over here at uh, the welcome uh, table. Which is that box. Oh, it's at the box. I'm sorry. Not the welcome well, flag. So. It's We're over there at the box. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and uh, we'd love to get some information from you just so we can stay in contact with you and let you know what's going on here at Restoration. But uh, also, again, to, to help you... Um, become part of the community and a couple of cool things happen when you do that not only do you become part of the community and then you get all the benefits of being part of the community but you also get a gift which you're gonna want to put ice cream in today put ice cream in yeah <laughs> it's a it's the teal version of our mug right now 15 cereal. ounces cereal it's a great mug i'll put that there for <laughs> our online community and also we give three dollars to a local food bank and so just by telling us who you are you're making a difference in the lives of somebody nearby so thank you uh for playing your part this morning uh, a couple things we want to draw your attention to uh, that are happening in the next, uh, I'd say, month and a half or so. The first one is that we have a quarter carnival coming up on June 12th. Yeah, it's a really fun event uh, that we do for our community. We've done this a few years in the past. We didn't do it last year because of, you know, the pandemic, but we've done it in the past, and it's been a phenomenal uh, way to engage our community, but, but also it's a phenomenal fundraiser for a week that we call Be Rich that we do in the fall. 
We've raised upwards to 1200 I think one year we raised $1,400 in quarters. Mm -hmm. It's a lot of quarters to count. Yeah. Uh, but then we turn that around and we pour it back into our community through acts of service and loving on our community. Um, it's usually about the amount of ways. laundry we end up paying for when we do our laundry. Yeah, we go to a laundromat right. usually with mm -hmm. a you know fifteen hundred dollars or so, and we pay for all the laundry in that laundromat, which is really cool. We get to in engage with a lot of people and tell them about the love of Christ through it. Uh, and so here's the thing: we need to make this uh, quarter carnival a uh, raging success so that we can uh, love on our community, uh, and we need some volunteers in order to do that. Yeah. So we need uh, about. 15 more volunteers or so a lot of great roles set up tear down well here's the thing we already have 50 people coming to the event yeah right and that's on the you know it just opened last week so we need people to run the event yeah <laughs> we're we're right. imagining about 250 to 300 kids sure. will probably run through this event um, or family any, by the time any age can come and play quarter games that's true us. that is They're true fun. you you'll be playing i'm sure uh yeah you get a little competitive I'll throw, s I'll throw some You'll baseballs throw some at some bottles or something. Yeah, that'll be fun. <laughs> yeah. uh, so if you would like to help make this a success, uh, we really, really, it's a great, not only serving is a great way to make it a success, but it's a great way to meet people. It's a great way to help us accomplish our mission. It's a great way to get involved here at Restoration. So uh, our good friend Nicole, who is organizing the event, is going to be hanging out um, at the welcome table afterward. I would encourage you to go talk to her if you are in person. If you are online, there should be a link dropping in the comments right now. Click that link, sign up for something that seems fun. Uh, we, if need you tear are down, or tear we need setup and tear down, and then people to run the games. So, yes, and there's yep. about 10 games or so that need some That'll be like 15 still. games. Yeah. yeah. And uh, we also have concessions and things like that. So yes. not, none of the jobs are super specific. You don't need any special skills. You just need to have a friendly face and willing to engage people. And you said this so. is Saturday, June 12th. 12th. And the, the actual carnival time is from 2 to 4 p.m. Yep. Right? Yep. Yep. Uh, the next thing is VBS, Vacation Bible School. We love Vacation Bible yeah. School. It is in person this year. We did online last year. That was awesome. But we're back in person. It's going to yes. be awesome. So excited. And uh, the registration for the kids opens up on June 6th. Uh, there are a number of ways that you can help make that a success right now as well. And one of those, of course, is to volunteer. volunteer right? <laughs> we need volunteers. Yeah. Uh, ways to serve. Um, you could be crew leaders. You could help run games. You could run teach a Bible lesson. All sorts of different ways you to just, volunteer. You can hang out with a small group of kids. For hang out with small. Too, that's which right. I think is one of our volunteers' yes. favorite things to do because they really get to know the kids. Yeah, you hang out with a, a small group of five kids. Yeah, you yeah. really get to know them, and you really become a, a discipling entity in their life, which is really really cool. So do you hear Ross say, "Run the games." What do you think Ross likes to do at Vacation Bible School? I'm I'm not. You're the game. <laughs> I, I used to be the game guy. Oh, you're also the goofy guy up front. Yeah, just gets yeah I got I got lots, Ross I got has lots fun of roles. At VBS. He can't wait. It's a blast, yeah. Huh? Yep. Uh, so VBS is July 11th through the 15th. Yep. And we need volunteers. We need about, I mean, the more volunteers we have, the more, here's the thing. Kate yeah. was telling me. The more volunteers we have to run the cruise, the more kids we can invite to VBS. Uh, and so uh, we really encourage you, if you're free that week in the evening, to come and volunteer. It is a phenomenal week, not just for the kids. I guarantee you'll learn, you'll be transformed, you will change because of your time with VBS as well. So if you're um, ready to do that, you can do that on our website. Uh, links are being dropped online as well. But if you, those of you in person can go to our website, you can... Um yeah, we had a good, strong <coughs> start. We had like 14 people sign up right away last week. So this is the only second week we're talking about it. Mm -hmm. But the goal is 60. Yes. So we're not there yet. Long ways to go. Yeah. So uh, a couple, a couple other ways that you can help, though, is uh, sponsoring a child. Yes. So if there are a couple ways you can sponsor a child, I think in person you can sponsor a child by going over to the treasure chest over there. Yep. And then online, if you go to our website, go to the VBS tab of our website, and you can sponsor a child there as well. It's a $10 suggested donation. Yep. If you could put any amount in an envelope like this. You can get them in that treasure chest and then drop them in the offering box. And the reason we sponsor children is because we want VBS to be free for anybody in our community who wants to come. And so we uh, basically take the, the burden of the financial that any kid might have <coughs> and allow them to go for free. So yeah. in addition to that, the last, well, there's two more things. You can be praying for the event, certainly. Be yes. praying for That's number one, uh, actually. Yeah, VBS. Um, and we'll have a prayer guide actually coming out in a couple weeks to help you, uh, guide you through how to pray for VBS. Uh, but the th fourth thing is donate through Amazon. Which it went gangbusters this week. Kate yeah. te texted me a picture of all the boxes outside of her house from Amazon. Oh so that's fun. Yeah, you can find that link on the website as yeah. well. Yeah. So uh, if you want to donate specific items, you can just go to the Amazon list. Again, you can find this on our website. It's being dropped in the comments. Uh, for those of you in person who actually received this in an email this morning, and so a lot of ways that you can help make VBS a success. When you say that, what he means is you got an email this morning, and the main reason we sent it was because why? 
We we'll have slide. We'll, yeah, you guys are missing slides on Sunday morning when we were out here yes. in the lawn. You guys, you, know, you don't get all the the profound truths that I share with you. You miss those. You miss seeing so how your, we're missing how your thoughts are organized you behind yeah. you. <laughs> and the scripture is available to you yes. there too. But So you do have a link to access that. And then I also linked all of these things that we're talking about. So yeah. if, you, if you register to attend here on the lawn, you should have received an email this morning with those links. There you go. Cool. Yeah. So we exist off the generosity of our people. We believe Wait, that. One more thing. Oh, man. Sorry. What? You're really on? ready to go. I am. Next Sunday, <laughs> we are online oh, yeah. only because it's Memorial, Memorial Day, Day weekend. weekend. Yeah. So these, this really applies to our friends on the lawn here. Yeah. Um, but come join us. You can join us on Facebook or at Church Online, and we'll send links and stuff yes, to that for yes. you. But we are going to take a. A respite. Yeah, for everybody who's been. We'll do that a few times. The major holidays yeah. this summer will be online only. So mm -hmm. uh, join us there. And then stay tuned for what the plan is after that, because we're still figuring it yes, out. Yes, we are. Okay. <laughs> so we do exist off the generosity of our people. We believe that we serve a very generous God and that he has called us to mimic what he does and who he is. And so we believe that being generous is essentially being Christ-like. And so we strive to be generous, uh, not just with our giving, but again, with our serving. All that we've talked about this morning is really generosity giving of your time, giving of your energy, giving of your, your resources, your talents to make all of what we do here at Restoration Church a reality. So thank you for the ways that you play your part generously to make Restoration Church happen. Uh, if you would like to give financially to the cause of Christ here, there are four different ways that you can do that. You can give through our app, text give. You can give through our website, or for those of you in person, you can also go to a Dropbox right over there and give cash or check if that is how you prefer to do it. I'm going to say teaching this morning. Heavenly Father, I want to thank you for who you are. I want to thank you how you have called us to be like you, and we believe that following Jesus makes us better at life, but it also makes life better. And so we strive to be like you, Father. We strive to be close to you, and we strive to love on our community well. The resources that come in, not only, again, financially, but in time and in energy and in talents given to make restoration happen. We want to thank you. We want to honor you. We want to praise your name this morning. And we do so in the name of Jesus. Amen. Cool. Hello, hello. Hey, friends, today we are starting uh, a brand new sermon series. But before we do that, I want to uh, invite a good friend of mine, Brian Weber uh, Ford. Brian serves as the <coughs> executive minister for Converge Mid Atlantic. You guys may know that we are part of a nationwide movement called Converge. Uh, there are 11 districts within the nation. Uh, we are one of them. We are part of the Mid Atlantic District, and there are about 110 Converge churches in the Mid Atlantic region. And Brian is uh, the the executive minister over those 110 uh, churches. And so, am I not in the camera? Oh, man. Uh, and so Brian has some great updates for us. Uh, as part of a converged church, we want to always um, be privy to what is going on in the movement as a whole. And so I've invited Brian forward to share a little bit about what's going on with Converge. So welcome, Brian. And you know what's cool about Brian? Yeah. Um, yeah just That's a camera right there, yeah. Uh, what's really cool about Brian is that he was instrumental in starting Restoration Church oh, thank you. Thank so many years ago. Yeah. Uh, he's become a good friend of mine and mentor I of mine. And uh, so ha having him in the area, he moved down to um, to Maryland a few years ago. Ocean City, I know. Everybody That's sounds, they say, oh, poor you. Yeah, right? poor you, right? Yeah. 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 And so he's not uh, in this in this area uh, all that much anymore. And so when he is, we, we take advantage of you being able to share with what's up. Oh going on with uh yeah. with converge thanks Ron. hey it's wonderful <coughs> to be here i know summer arrived a week early i'm i'm not upset about that at all right and it, what's funny to watch around and see all the sunglasses on i took mine off so you can see my face my my daughter got up this morning with a snoopy t-shirt you know snoopy with the sunglasses on so now i feel like everybody out here is just like a sea of snoopy faces which yeah. is fun for me but i don't know anyway uh, it, it's a a pri really a privilege to be here. I love coming and, and um, just saying hello and greetings. 
uh, to the chur to churches in our our um, our family up and up and down the East Coast. Conversion Atlantic is a movement of churches like Ross said from New York to South Carolina, and uh, man, has it been an interesting and challenging year for churches. Um, and I know that you feel that. Um, you know, one of the uniqueness of we're s like we're having a service outside, mm -hmm. which I think probably should do anyway from time to time because wow, a gorgeous day. But like, um, but the reason for all the necessities and the challenges and the ups and downs and to be a family of churches to try to um, to move together, to work together. You all don't always see it, but um, the, the family of pastors, Ross and the others, constantly checking in on one another, yeah. encouraging each other, sh asking questions. What are you doing in your church? How are you handling, handling this? How are we handling? Just try to move forward as best as we can together. And it's really a beautiful thing. It's really a beautiful thing. And the, the goal in all of that is that we'd have strong, vibrant, gospel-centered churches in every neighborhood uh, mm. across the Woo. country, Love especially that. here in the East Coast yeah. where we live. And um, I remember seven years ago being here when, this, when, when we had our first service here. And I see mm -hmm. Jim nodding his head because he was there. I see a lot of uh, Brian and Mary. I see a lot of faces that I recognize from, from that day. And um, and it's exciting. We're still doing that. In fact, today in uh, the Shenandoah Valley of Virginia is the grand opening of a new church today. Wow, it's cool. Today. Yeah. And it marks, even in the midst of the pandemic, it marks the ninth grand opening of a new church since September mm. of last year. Okay. Cool. So that's some of the things that we're participating in, that you participate in as a as a, a member of this vibrant community of uh, of churches so um, just I guess the last thing I wanted to say as a word of encouragement I've been thinking a lot about a text in Galatians chapter 6 where the Apostle Paul says uh, don't give up doing good he says don't yeah. give up doing good and when he says that it, it kind of it, it kind of uh, suggests that we do get weary and tired of doing the right thing. He says, don't, don't grow <coughs> weary in doing what is good, but in the proper time you will receive a harvest mm. if you don't, if you don't uh, give up. And that idea of a harvest, you know, is that you, that you reap what you sow. So if, if, you, if, you, if you're giving into this world unhealthy things, anger, bitterness, grumpiness, selfishness, that's what you're going to get back. But if you give into this world godly things, spiritual things, goodness, righteousness, seeking to do the right thing, seeking to do the just thing whenever you can, then the scripture says in that text that what you receive back is eternal life. The, 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 the goodness of the spirit reflected through our lives that starts now on this earth and lasts forever mm, in heaven. Yeah. So the, so the, the apostle <coughs> says to us, don't grow weary in doing good. And I say that to you. In the midst of all the challenges and trials that we've been having in this year, so into this world, so into this neighborhood, so into your neighbors, godly things, goodness, righteousness, justice, and you will receive a harvest when the time is right. Hmm. So thanks for letting me come today. I'm just really excited to be here with you. And uh, think of uh, Virginia Hills Church in Woodstock, Virginia today. Because <laughs> just about a half an hour, they're getting started. So Ooh, cool. Isn't that great? Thank you, guys. Say a prayer for them. Okay. Thanks, Brian. And that's a great transition to uh, this new sermon series that we are starting this morning, uh, titled The Renewing of Our Minds. How many of you feel like you need a renewal of your mind? How many of uh, think about the last 14 months, you've been exhausted, your mind is tired, you're having decision fatigue, so many controversies, so many decisions, such a hard world to navigate over the last 14 months. A renewing of the mind, I think, would be great for so many of us. So I'm curious, how many of you feel like you have this war going on in your mind? Sometimes you feel like, like there's a battle going on in your mind between the, the faith that we ought to have and, and the fear that we do have or, or the confidence that we should have in Christ 
that God is with us and God is for us and God is on our side and he is leading us and, and what we feel in our circumstances and the challenges sometimes can cripple us and paralyze us. What I discovered, my friends, is there is certainly a battle going on in our minds and most of life's battles are either won or lost in our minds. And the more I've studied scripture and the more I've even looked into neuroscience, I was a psychology minor, so you know, I know what I'm talking about here. <laughs> but I've read some books. <laughs> most of life's battles are won or lost in the minds. And maybe you've experienced this and maybe you know this already. Most of life's battles are won or lost in the minds. And the good news is that God's word is powerful, not just to help you, but to transform you, to renew your mind with the truth of his word. And so today we're going to be looking at a a passage out of 2 Corinthians chapter 10. This is what Paul says. And again, for those of you who are with us in person, uh, you received this, these slides in, uh, in an email this morning if you registered to be here with us this morning. Um, otherwise, you can certainly go back and watch and uh, get some of this. But if you have text with you this morning, one way or another, we're going to be in chapter 10 of 2 Corinthians. Here's what Paul says. For though we live in the world, we do not wage war, we do not wage war as the world does, the weapons we fight with are not the weapons of the world. On the contrary, they have divine power. The Greek word translated power is the word dunamis. We get our word dynamite from this, right? The power of God is like a brick of dynamite just being thrown to demolish whatever it touches. We get the, uh, it's, it's, such a, it's such a powerful, miraculous, explosive power from God. We have this divine power to demolish and to destroy he says, strongholds. Now, we don't use the word stronghold, I think, very often in our everyday life. It's a Greek word, akurama, which refers to a military bunker. It's, it's the idea that nothing can penetrate this. It's a safe house, and in some contexts, it's even a prison. And so think about this. The devil, right, he is our spiritual enemy, wants to attack our minds and create strongholds of deception around our thoughts. And the devil tries to shape our thinking one lie at a time. One thought at a time. The devil is trying to manipulate our minds and shape our minds one lie or deceptive thought at a time until there is an impenetrable, impenetrable stronghold around those lies. You guys know what I'm talking about? Some of you know exactly what I'm talking about. There is an imp unpen impenetrable, I gotta, uh, uh, impenetrable stronghold around those lies in your mind and you are afraid that it's never going to change and that nothing new is ever going to happen, and nothing ever is going to be done to change the trajectory you feel like your life is on. And it begins so simply, doesn't it? It begins so subtly, doesn't it? Yeah, you can't trust that guy. No, you can't trust that person. No, people can't be trusted. You're never going to succeed. You're always going to be broke. You're never going to have a good marriage. God doesn't hear your prayers. God doesn't care about you. You're never going to make a difference in this world. You're never going to amount to anything. That thing that you did is just, it's too bad. You can't be forgiven. You're always going to be unlovable. You're always going to be broken beyond repair. And so how do we battle these, these thoughts, right? Well, Paul continues. He says, we demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God and what God then thinks of us. And how do we do that? Well, with God's help, we take captive every thought and we make it obedient to Christ. How do you demolish the stronghold of lies and deception that the enemy has set up against you? Well, we take captive every single thought and we make it obedient to Christ. And today we're starting this new sermon series that I think is going to be really, really important because study after study shows that unhealthy thought patterns deteriorating mental conditions has been on the rise over the last 14 months. And again, maybe some of you have felt it. So many lives are being held captive by our thoughts. Thoughts about the pandemic, thoughts about our government or mitigations or mask wearing or engaging people in general or fear of people and getting out in public. And this burden is placed on top of already exhausted minds because, come on, right, before the pandemic hit, for a lot of us, it was still hard to get out of bed. It didn't take a global pandemic to create a stronghold around our minds for a lot of us. For a lot of us, it was still hard to look in the mirror and like what we saw. It, it was still hard to walk freely from the guilt of, of what should have been said or, or what should have been done. 
And instead of walking freely and instead of walking courageously and confidently, so many of us, even before the pandemic and the exhaustion and the stronghold that it has created around so many of us, even before all of that, so many of us were a prisoner to our thinking. And what scripture and science confirm is that our lives are always moving in the direction of your strongest thoughts. Let me say that again. Your lives, our lives are always moving in the direction of our strongest thoughts. So what we tend to think actually comes out in our life. And both science and scripture agree about this. Right? This isn't just pie in the sky, Bible speak. This isn't just have faith and everything's going to work out. This isn't, well, you know, you didn't believe hard enough and that's why that happened. Or you didn't believe hard enough and if you did, then you'd be cured of your depression. No, in this series, we're going we're gonna to look at how the brain works. And we're going to look at what the Bible then has to say about it. And I've done a lot of research on cognitive behavior psychology. And what I've learned is that a lot of our problems are related to our thought processes. Some relational challenges, eating disorders, eating disorders, some addictions, some forms of anxiety are actually a direct result of our toxic thinking. The strongholds in our mind, the deception and the lies that the enemy has put in place. That's what science says. Here's what scripture has to say. Proverbs 23, 7. For as he thinks in his heart, so he is. All right, the life we so often live is a reflection of the thoughts that we think. The life that we live is so often a reflection of the thoughts that we think. What we think determines who we become. Or in other words, if you tend to think, I, I can't do something, you know, I'm never going to be good enough, I'm never going to accomplish that. If you think that you can't, guess what? You probably won't. But if you think that you can, by the grace of God, you probably will. Uh, yesterday at uh, my son's baseball game, I'm the coach of his team, and, and uh, we were down by five runs already in the second inning. Do you want me to, do you want me to switch this? Okay. One second, y'all. Hello, hello. Woo. We were down by five runs already in the second inning, and uh, you could see just how disheveled his team was. And, and uh, they had already lost the game in their minds. You guys ever experienced this before? You're on a team. You're down by so many runs. It's so early in the game. Yeah, you've already lost the game in your minds. And I said to them, guys, if you've already lost the game in your minds, guess what's going to happen? You're going to lose the game. You're not going to try. You're not going to hustle. You're not going to care. But guys, if you believe that you can still win this game, you try, you put the effort in, you're diligent, then guys, we can still win this. And guess what? We win the game. If you dwell on your problems, right, the world is getting bad, the world's getting worse, your problems are, are going to overwhelm you. But instead, if you look for some solutions, if you believe that you can have faith, you'll find some solutions and you will see that faith will arise within you. If you always feel like a victim, guess what? You're going to become a victim. If instead you believe that you can overcome by the power of Christ within you, my friends, you can overcome. In so many cases, the life we have is a reflection of the thoughts that we think. And what I want to do today is simply challenge you to stop and to think about what you think about. Like seriously, just stop and think about what you think about. We're going to do a thought audit real quick here. And I just want to present a couple of different categories, and I want to challenge you to think about what you think about. I want to present a couple of different contrasting mindsets. For instance, when you wake up in the morning, are you characterized by worried thoughts, panic, anxiety, fear? Or would you say that your thoughts are typically characterized by peace? What's, what's intrinsic to you? What's natural? Where does your mind go that when you wake up? Do you tend to wake up and have your mind drift toward fear? Oh man, what's going to go wrong today? Or, or I'm worried about my kids, or I'm worried about my health, or I'm worried about the economy, or I'm worried about the state of the world and the direction that the world is heading. And, you know, our country is just out of control. Do you find yourself drifting towards worried thoughts? Or, even if things are bad and complicated, do you find yourself casting your cares upon God? And recognizing that there is peace that goes beyond all human ability to understand. And then you sense his presence and his goodness and his spirit within you and even when things aren't the way that you want, would you say that you're auditing your thoughts towards worry or towards peace? A second category would, might be this. Uh, do your thoughts drift towards the negative or do they drift towards the positive? You know, when you wake up in the morning, do you have negative thoughts overwhelming you or do your thoughts kind of naturally drift towards positive things? Do you wake up and find yourself negative and critical and do you assume the worst instead of believing the best? Do you look at your day and say, oh, it's going to be bad. Oh, times are tough. You know, I'm always just so busy and there's not enough of me to go around and, and the world's going to hell in a hell basket anyway and so, and so who cares, right? Or do you wake up with a positive faith 
And again, even if things are difficult, you say, you know what? Christ is with me, and he's going to help me overcome. Yeah, and things may be difficult in the world, but I'm thankful for a God who is working all things to bring about good to those who are called according to his purpose. How do you wake up in the morning? Do you drift towards the negative, or do you drift towards the positive? And a third category I want you to ask yourself is, when it comes to what you think about, are your thoughts temporal, you know, focused on the things of this world, or are they focused on the eternal? Your thoughts may be more worldly. You're just concerned with what you have and what you wear, what you look like, or who liked that post, or how many followers you have, and, and what everybody else thinks about you, or do they drift towards the eternal and what truly matters? Which is God has given you a life to steward and spiritual gifts to use, and what you have is actually to be invested and given to make a difference in the lives of the people around you. So everything else may burn away, yes, but will your life count eternally? Where would you say your thoughts drift towards that? Naturally, do you drift towards the temporal or do you drift towards the eternal? And the reason I want you to do this is because what we think about matters more than we can even imagine. You see, what comes into our minds comes out in our life. No matter what you do or what you have or who you know or what you buy or where you live or where you travel, what you think about, what comes into your mind is going to come out in your life. My friends, you cannot have a positive life when you have a negative mind. Why? Because your life is always moving in the direction of your strongest thoughts. And so the question I want you to wrestle with this morning is if your life is always moving in the direction of your strongest thoughts, are you excited about where your thoughts are taking you? If your life is always moving in the direction of your strongest thoughts, are you excited about where your thoughts are taking you? And so over the next couple weeks, we're going to go on a journey, and we're going to look at the Apostle Paul and what he wrote uh, to various communities, and we're going to ask God to renew our minds with the truth of his word And today we're going to lay a foundation that we will build upon in the weeks to come. And so the first thing I want to do is to uh, help you identify what your biggest stronghold is. What is the biggest mental stronghold that is holding you back? Just take a second to think about that. What is the biggest mental stronghold that is holding you back? You might think over and over again, you know, I'm just not good enough. Or my past is too bad for God to use me. Or... I, I can't trust the people around me or, you know, I, I did something and I, and I hurt somebody and I can't forgive myself and, and I don't deserve to be happy then. Or I'm always going to battle with my weight or I'm never going to be good enough and I'm never going to have enough money or I can never be close enough to God or I'm never going to get a job that's fulfilling me with something that I love or, or all of my relationships are always going to break down or If I go out into the world, you know, I'm going to get sick, and so I'm afraid to go out, and I'm going to pass the disease on to others, or the government is controlling, and we're all being brainwashed, right? What is is the stronghold, the biggest stronghold? What is one stronghold that you are struggling with that is holding you back? If you find yourself identifying your negative thoughts, I want you to embrace then a, a reality that neuroscience would help us understand. The reality that our negative thoughts are changing the chemical makeup of your brain. And the reason is because every thought creates a neurochemical change in our body. When you think a positive thought, you know, you get a, you get a surge of dopamine. You get this rewarding neurotransmitter, a very legal and exciting drug called dopamine. When you think a positive thought, when something happens, when you're happy, when you're joyful, when something good happens, you get a little surge of dopamine. Every time your, your brain d- drops some dopamine, you get this little hit, this buzz, this thrill, and you want more and more of it. And so, you know, someone you like and respect comments on your p- latest post, and you get a little surge of dopamine, right? That's why in, in middle schoolers, they do all these studies, and they're like, yeah, those, those people who don't get many likes, man, they, they funnel down into depression. When people aren't commenting on their Instagram posts and, and, and all this, man, they're, they're funneling down into depression because the, the dopamine, they're expecting something, and they're not getting that, and it's funneling them down into depression. You get a little dopamine when, when someone you like and respects comments on your Instagram posts. Your boss congratulates you on a job well done. You get a little dopamine, right? A little positive surge of release in your brain, a little dopamine. And, and so what's so interesting is that the more often you think a thought, science tells us that the easier it is to actually think that thought again. Once you think a thought, you're creating a neural pathway in your brain. And literally, we have billions of neural pathways in our brain. And the more often we think that thought, the more 
the connection is there and the easier it is to think that thought again. And before long, whatever we have been thinking becomes our default. And all of a sudden, you've built a stronghold. If you believe a lie for long enough, you start to be impacted as if that lie were true. You get stuck in a rut. So imagine this. If you walked out in your yard and you walked across your yard a hundred days in a row, you would eventually create a pathway in your yard. And if in your mind you thought a lie for 100 100 days straight, you would start believing that lie. You would create a neural pathway through your brain. And with God's help, what we're going to do then is to renew our minds. We're going to stay off that old path and we're going to begin to walk a new one. And if I stay off that path that we've created in our yard, if we stay off that path for 100 days, what happens? Well, the grass is going to start growing back. And there's more resistance and it's not as easy to walk now. And I forge a new pathway in my brain toward the truth. And the truth, my friends, will ultimately then set us free. This is science. This is godly, my friends, because God created science, right? Romans 12, 2 says, Paul says it this way. He said, don't be conformed to the patterns of this world. He says, don't, don't be conformed to the wrong ways of thinking, to the negative thoughts. He said, but be transformed. How? By the renewing of your mind. We're going to stay off the destructive negative paths we're creating. And new paths are going to be created then out of truth. And I don't know how this is going to play out in your life. But maybe your path is this, right? It's, it's a frustrating day at work. And you come home and it's been crazy at home. And the old path that you used to walk, right? Your default way of thinking, the stronghold, tells you to go inside and to yell. And to get in a fight. Because you're already stressed because of work and now you're going into an even more stressful situation. And so that old path tells you to go in. But we're going to stay off that old path. And we're going to capture that thought. And you might count to three or to ten or maybe in your case it's 110. You're going to say a prayer and instead you're going to walk a different road. And you come up and say, you know what, I'm sorry. It's been a difficult day. And you hug and you change the tone by changing the path. Or or maybe you feel bad about yourself, and so when you feel bad about yourself, your default, right, the path that you've taken over and over and over again is to go to the freezer and eat some ice cream, and instead of eating the little bit, you eat the whole gallon, and now you feel even worse about yourself. What you're going to do is create a new pathway, so instead of walking to that freezer, you're going to go walk to the front yard, and you're going to get some exercise, and your body's going to release a little drop of dopamine, and you're going to start feeling better about yourself. Some adrenaline, and you're going to feel like a new path is being created in your brain. It's a first step. Or when you're bored, what do you do? Well, you pick up your phone and you look on Instagram and you scroll through your friends and you realize that all your friends are having such a good time and they have such a great life and your life doesn't match up to theirs. You feel like your life is just pathetic compared to all theirs. And and why did they all go out Friday night? And why didn't they invite you? And you're such a loser, right? And we think these things. Well, we're going to get off that old path and we're going to do something new. We're going to create a new path by choosing different habits. And instead, we're going to turn maybe to the YouVersion Bible app, right? We're going to open up our Bibles and we're going to read what God has to say about us. And we're going to put something different in our brain that's going to renew our mind. You see, to think in a different way, we're going to have to forge a new path in our brain because the more that you walk the path, the easier it is to travel. And the more you stay off the old one, the more it's going to weaken and it's harder than to think those same thoughts again. And so here is your assignment. I want you to identify the biggest stronghold that is holding you back. We're not going to attack all 73 strongholds this morning. I simply want you to identify one stronghold that you feel is holding you back. And we're going to start with just one, and we're going to focus on that. And so what is it for you? You might uh, might battle with identity, and you might feel like, you know what, I'm just not lovable. Maybe that's your one. Or or you might wrongly believe that that because you've said it for 1,000 days, I'm never going to be good enough, right? And you believed it now because you've said it in your mind for 1,000 days, I'm never going to be good enough. Maybe that's your stronghold. Or maybe I I don't deserve anything good. Or I'm always going to be broken. There are haves and there are have-nots, and I'm always just going to be one of the have-nots. You feel hopeless. You feel helpless. You feel broken. Maybe you feel like life is pointless. I want you to identify that stronghold and I want you to name it. Because you cannot defeat what you do not define. You cannot defeat what you cannot define. And so I want you to think about what is that one stronghold that is holding you back. I want you to name it. I want you to claim it. I want you to define it. Because you cannot defeat what you do not define. Identify what that biggest stronghold is. And then the second part of your assignment is this. Name the truth that demolishes the stronghold. 
And why does the truth matter? Because Jesus said in John chapter 8 that you shall know the truth and the truth will do what? Set you free. See, the lie puts us into spiritual bondage. And some of you have built your life within the cage of that spiritual bondage. You've built your foundation upon the foundation of a lie. But if you know the truth, my friends, the truth can begin to set you free. See, Paul tells us that whatever that stronghold is that's holding you prisoner in your mind, what do we do with it? Well, demolish it, he told the Corinthians. We demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God. And then he goes on to say, here's what we do. We take captive. We are not a prisoner to our thoughts. We take our thoughts prisoner. We take our thoughts captive and we make them obedient to Christ. We take our thoughts captive, which means in the beginning that we recognize it as an enemy thought. A lie from the father of lies. And then we take it captive. We, we attack it. The word for take captive means uh, literally to, to attack with a sword or with a spear. And I love this, right, because we talk about all the spiritual weapons that we have at our disposal. We talk about the helmet of salvation and the belt of truth and the breastplate of, right, breastplate of righteousness, the feet that are fitted with the readiness of the gospel, the shield of faith held up before us. But then we talk about the, the spiritual offensive weapons we have. We have the, the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God, and we have prayer. We have offensive weapons. We let God's word attack and take captive any lies that have held us hostage. And so friends, what's your stronghold? What's the dominant lie that your spiritual enemy has tried to use to destroy your faith, to kill your relationships, to steal your joy, to rob you of the intimacy that God wants you to have with him? What is your stronghold? You know, one, one of mine, uh, I've, I've wrestled this, with this for um, a long time in my life, but certainly I think it's kind of come to a head over the last 14 months. It's the lie that I'm never good enough. Do you guys know that I wrestle with that? I think I've shared with you this before, that, that I am inadequate. I'm inadequate to serve this community the way that it needs to be served. I, I'm an inadequate pastor. I, I can't do this well enough. Certainly the pandemic has, uh, has spoken to over that over me many, many times. I'm not a good enough father. I'm not a good enough husband. I struggle with this. This is one of the strongholds that, that the devil has used to keep me inactive and to doing what God has called me to do. That's one of my strongholds. I'm inadequate. And the challenge with that lie, and here's where this gets challenging right, and confusing. The challenge with that lie is that there is a, a, a fragment of truth in it which makes it easy to believe. Right? I'm a sinful human being. I, I get that. And because of my limitations, there's a lot of me that will never be enough. There's a lot of me that will always be inadequate. But the temptation is just to pat myself on the back and say, it's okay. Yeah, I'm a sinner and I'm flawed and I get that and I, and I and I it's okay. You know, I need to pat myself on the back. I need to be easier with myself. And some of you need to listen to this because that's what you have been doing your whole life. You have given yourself excuses to stay cap to stay imprisoned and to, and to keep that stronghold intact. Somebody, yourself maybe, somebody else has get patting you on the back and puffing you up and you feel like your life is fragile. Because you've been puffed up, puffed up your whole life. That's all you've been told. No one's ever told you the truth. You've just been puffed up. And you feel fragile because you feel like your life is a balloon that's ready to pop. And instead of attacking the lies and taking them captive by being honest and speaking the truth, you have let those lies capture you and create a stronghold around your mind. But thankfully, you don't have to rely on what's inside of us. We don't have to rely on what's inside of us. We don't have to rely on how we feel. There is a power greater than me that absolutely and completely <clears throat> is more than enough for all of us. Because I know the truth. I know God's word. It is in me. And God wor God's word tells me, right, the sword of the spirit that I attack that stronghold with, the truth of God's word that sets me free, Second Peter 1.3, his divine power has given me everything that I need. It's not about my own abilities. It's not about my own strength, right? If I find myself being inadequate, it's because I'm relying too much on myself. No, his divine power has given us everything we need for a godly life. He will not call me to something without giving me the tools to accomplish it. So when I am weak, his strength is made perfect in me. 
I've got the same spirit in me that raised Christ from the dead dwelling inside of me. His living word does the work that I cannot do. His power is there for me when I don't have what it takes. And he has given me everything that I need for life and godliness. My friends, know the truth and the truth will set you free. And so what's the driving lie that has held you back? What is that stronghold that has held you back? What's the truth then that will set you free? And maybe you think, I can't get it all done. I never can get it all done. Well, your, your truth is, I can do all things through Christ, my Savior, Jesus Christ, who gives me strength when I'm weak. He makes me strong. Maybe you feel like I'm never going to be attractive enough. I, I don't like the way that I look. My friends, you need to know that you are fearfully and wonderfully made in the image of God by the grace of God. He loves you unconditionally, and he has given you gifts to make a difference in this world. Maybe you feel like, uh, I'm, just, I'm always going to be miserable. I'm always going to be depressed. Well, you need to know that the joy of the Lord is your strength. And the moment that that lie tells you you're going to always be alone, you need to respond to that lie. No, my God is with me, and he will never leave me. He will never forsake me. Ah, uh, but you're just nothing but a victim. No, God's word tells me that I am an overcomer by the blood of the lamb and the words of his testimony. I am not who others say that I am. I am not even who the lies in my own mind say that I am. I am who God says that I am, and I will know the truth, and the truth will set me free. I am a beloved child, unconditionally loved. My friends, your life in so many ways is moving in the direction of your strongest thoughts. What comes into your mind comes out in your life. You cannot have a positive, faith-filled life when you have negative, fear-filled thoughts. So what are we going to do? We're going to capture those lies. We're going to name those lies. We're going to recognize them as lies, and we're going to attack them with the truth. We're going to replace those lies with the truth of God's word, and by the power of God, you will not stay locked in that prison. Because when Jesus holds the key that sets you free and you know the truth, and the truth isn't just a concept, the truth is a person. His name is Jesus, my friends. He will set you free. And so, Father, today we ask by the power of your word that you would renew our minds with truth. We recognize that there is a war going on in our mind, and I want to name one stronghold, not all 73, not all 150 that we're dealing with, just one this morning. And I want to know then the truth of God that sets me free. If, if that is you this morning, if there's a stronghold that is holding you back, my friends, I want you to know that God is for you and that God is with you. And that God wants to free your mind from the agony that you are experiencing. And so, Father, would you begin a, a new work of renewing our minds this morning? And, and God, in the same way that it may take years and years to have a lie ingrained in our neural pathways, we recognize, Father, that it's going to take some time to renew our minds. And so, God, give us the faith to walk this journey with you, to stay off the old paths of lies and destruction. And when we, when we hear those lies of, of destruction and the stronghold, Father, being tightened around our minds, I pray that that we then would claim the truth and we would create new paths of truths within our mind. Renew our minds, Father. God, I pray that over the next few weeks as we look at your word and as we discuss in our, in our various groups, <clears throat> that you would use your body and use your word to help renew our minds and to change our thinking and to change our lives. Would you do this in us, Father? We recognize, Father, that some of the lies that we believe are about you. Father, Father, we know that there are many people who, who have believed lies that you are not for us, that you are not good, that you do not care, that we have a distorted view of you in our minds, Father. And, and for years, Father, we recognize that some people have had a wrong view of God, that, that we thought that maybe you are angry at us, that you are mad at us, that you could never love us after all that we have done, that, that we're just used up goods, that we're just trash, that we've done too many bad things. And Father, we recognize and we claim right now that we need to replace those lies with the truth of your word. And so, Father, we want to recognize who you are, and we want to honor you and glorify you this morning for who you are. We recognize, Father, you as a, you are a loving Father. You love us more than we could ever imagine. And even if we have done something really shameful, that there is nothing that we could do that would make you love us any less. And even if we're trying our best to be perfect, there's nothing that we could ever do to make you love us even more. Father, you simply love us, and you love us 
because because you simply love us, Father, sin and all, and you prove this by becoming like us in Jesus. And so, Father, we want to thank you and honor your name. And if there's anybody here this morning who does not know your word and what it says about them and who you are, Father, I pray that they would come and speak to me or, or somebody else on staff, Father, or an elder, so that we can share with them exactly who you are, Father, and they could be on a journey of being set free by the love of Christ. Father, thank you for what you're accomplishing here. Thank you for what you're accomplishing in us. May we be not content, Father, to live within the prison of our own minds, but may we, Father, recognize the strongholds and recognize then that they are demolished through the knowledge of God in Jesus Christ and all that you've accomplished for us, Father. And I pray that we would then would take every thought captive, that we would attack all of those negative and all of those lies, Father, we would attack it with the truth of your word. And we do pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Friends, thanks for joining us this morning at Restoration Church. I encourage you to join us again next week as we delve in to more of what Paul says about renewing our minds. God bless you all. Enjoy this gorgeous day. See ya.